In those days, Wardus was but a recent addition to the equipment of ships at sea. We were quite proud of our installation, and we only carried one operator. This man should have finished duty at midnight, yet here he was at half past twelve, and he was still listening in, but he was on the very point of retiring. He was, in fact, in the act of bending down to undo his boots when the dread call came, for in his interest he still retained the phones upon his ears. SOS Titanic calling. We have struck ice and require immediate assistance. And throwing the earphones on the table, he raced to the first officer who was on watch at the time. It is a dramatic thought that if the signal had been two or three minutes later, we wouldn't have picked it up. The news was at once brought to me. Curious how trivial things stamp themselves on the mind in moments of crisis, I can remember my door opening, the door on the other head of my bunk which communicated with the chart room. I had but recently turned in and wasn't asleep, and drowsily I said to myself, Who the dickens is this cheeky beggar coming into my cabin without knocking? Then the first officer was blurting out the facts, and you may be sure, I was very soon wide awake, with thoughts for nothing but doing all that was in the ship's power to render the aid called for. So incredible seemed the news that, having at once given orders to turn the ship, we were bound from New York to Gibraltar and other Mediterranean ports, while the Titanic was passing us westward bound, sixty miles to our norad, I got hold of the Marconi operator and assured myself that there could have been no mistake. Are you sure it is the Titanic that requires immediate assistance? I asked him. Yes, sir. But I had to ask again. You are absolutely certain. For remember, the wireless was not at the pitch of perfection and reliability it is today. Quite certain, he replied. All right, I said then. Tell him we are coming along as fast as we can. I went into the chart room, having obtained from the operator the Titanic's position. It was latitude 41 degrees 46 minutes north, longitude 50 degrees 14 west. I at once worked out the course and issued orders. Within a few minutes of the call, we were steaming all we knew to the rescue. The Carpathia was a 14-knot ship, but that night, for three and a half hours, she worked up to 17 knots. One of the first things I did, naturally, was to get up the chief engineer and explain the urgency of matters, and calling out an extra watch in the engine room, every ounce of power was got from the boilers, and every particle of steam used for the engineers, turning it from all other uses, such as heating. Fortunately, it was night. Fortunately, I mean, from one aspect, all our passengers were in their bunks. Many never woke up until the drama had been played out, because one of my first instructions was that as far as possible absolute silence should be maintained while every man was told to instruct any passengers seen about to return to their cabins and stay there. And as soon as the men heard what was wanted and why, many of them went to work without waiting to dress, good fellows. I had up the English doctor, purser and chief steward, and to these I gave the instructions as follows. The English doctor to remain in the first-class dining room, the Italian doctor in the second-class dining room, and the Hungarian doctor in third, all to have ready supplies of stimulants, restoratives, and other necessities. Persa, with his assistant Persa and chief steward, to receive the rescued at the different gangways, controlling our own stewards and assisting the Titanic passengers to the different dining rooms for accommodation and attention. They were also to get as far as possible names of survivors to be sent by wireless. The inspector, steerage stewards and masters at arms to control our own steerage passengers, keep them out of the third class dining hall and to restrain them from going on deck. Chief steward to call all hands and have coffee ready for our men and soup, coffee, tea, etc. for the rescued. Banquets to be placed ready in air gangways, in saloons and public rooms, and others handy for the boats. All spare berths in steerage to be prepared for Titanic's third-class passengers, while our own steerage occupants were to be grouped together. 
To all it was enjoined that the strictest silence and discipline should be maintained, while a steward was to be stationed in each gangway to reassure our own passengers should any hear noise and inquire. Such inquirers to be asked politely but firmly to return to and remain in their own cabins. Meanwhile, we were plying on through the night, a brilliant night of stars. I had been able to go to the bridge. To me, there, Marconi operator came reporting. He had picked up a message from the Titanic to the Olympic, asking the latter to have all her boats ready. The sense of tragedy was growing. But the Olympic homeward bound was hundreds of miles away, very much farther than we were. The Titanic had also called us. They asked how long we should be getting up. Say about four hours, I told the operator. We did it in three and a half hours. And tell her we shall have all our boats in readiness and all other preparations necessary to receive the rescued. I then gave the following orders to the first officer. Prepare and swing out all boats, all gangway doors to be opened, a block with line rope hooked in each gangway, a chair slung at each gangway for getting up sick and injured, pilot ladders and side ladders at gangways and over the side, cargo falls with both ends clear and bite secured along ship's side on deck, for boat ropes or to help people up. Lines and gaskets to be distributed about the decks to be handy for lashings, etc. For a derricks to be rigged and topped and steam on winches to get mails or other goods on board. Oil to be poured down lavatories both sides to quiet the sea. Canvas ash bags to be near gangways for the purpose of hauling up children or helpless. Companies' rockets to be fired from 3 a.m. every quarter of an hour to reassure the Titanic. An hour before, the Marconi operator had brought me a message from the Titanic that the engine room was filling. That had looked fatal. It left little doubt that she was going down. So to catch that green flare brought renewed hope. Almost at once, the second officer reported the first iceberg. It lay two points on the port bow, and it was the one whose presence was betrayed by the star beam. More and more now, where we all keyed up, icebergs loomed up and fell astern. We never slackened, though sometimes we altered course suddenly to avoid them. It was an anxious time with the Titanic's fateful experience very close in our minds. There were 700 souls on the Carpathia. These lives, as well as the survivors of the Titanic herself, depended on a sudden turn of the wheel. As soon as there was a chance that we were in view, we started sending up rockets at intervals of about a quarter of an hour, and when still nearer, fired the company's Roman candles, or night signals, to let them know it was the Carpathia that was approaching. Occasionally, we caught sight of a green light. We were getting pretty near the spot. By this time, the hope that their green signals had at first bred in us was gone. There was no sign of the Titanic herself. By now, it was about 3.35 a.m., we were almost up to the position, and had the giant liner been afloat, we should have seen her. The skies were clear, the stars gleaming, with that brightness which only a keen, frosty air brings to them, and visibility was as good as it could be on a moonless night. I put the engines on the standby so that the engineers should be on the alert for instant action. At four o'clock I stopped the engines. We were there. As if in corroboration of that judgment, I saw a green light just ahead of us, low down. That must be a boat, I knew. And just as I was planning to come alongside, I saw a big berg immediately in front of us. The second officer reporting it at the same moment. I had meant to take the boat on the port side, which was the lee side, if anything, though there wasn't much wind or sea. But the iceberg altered the plan. It was necessary to move with the utmost expedition. I swung the ship round, and so came alongside the first of the Titanic's boats on the starboard side. 
Devoutly thankful I was that the long race was over. Every minute had brought its risk, a risk that only keen eyes and quick decisions could meet, but with that feeling was the veritable ache which the now certain knowledge of the liner's loss brought. No sign of her. And below was the first boat containing survivors. A hail came up from her. We have only one seaman in the boat and cannot work very well. They were a little way off our gangway. All right, I told them, and brought the vessel right alongside. Then they started climbing aboard. Obviously they had got away in a hurry, for there were only twenty-five of them, whereas the capacity of the boat was fully forty. They were in charge of one officer. I asked that this officer should come to me as soon as he was on board, and to him I put the heart-rending inquiry, knowing with a terrible certainty what his answer was to be. The Titanic has gone down. Yes, he said. One word that meant so much so much that the man's voice broke on it. She went down at about 2.30. An hour and a half ago, alas, that we hadn't been nearer. But there was no time for vain regress. Daylight was just setting in, and what a sight that new day gradually revealed. Everywhere were icebergs. About a third of a mile on our starboard beam, was the one that a few minutes ago had faced us. Less than a hundred feet off our port quarter was a growler, a broken-off lump of ice ten to fifteen feet high and twenty-five feet long, but stretching as far as the eye could reach were masses of them. I instructed a junior officer to go to the wheelhouse deck and count them. Twenty-five there were over two hundred feet in height, and dozens ranging from a hundred and fifty down to fifty feet. And amid the tragic splendour of them as they lay in the first shafts of the rising sun, boats of the lost ship floated. From that moment we went on picking them up, and as the rescued came aboard, their thankfulness for safety was always mingled with the sense of their loss and the chattering cold that possessed them. Many of the women had been hours in those open boats, shielded from the almost arctic cold only by a coat hastily thrown over night clothes, telling of the urgency with which they had left the ship, suggesting to the imagination awful long drawn out anxiety before the slips were loosed and the boats were, were the boat was on the water and away. Slowly we cruised from boat to boat and as we neared the end of our questing, one gathered the enormity of the disaster. Altogether, we picked up 705 persons, but on the Titanic, crew and passengers numbered over 2,000, so many hundreds lost, who a few hours before had been members of a gay and distinguished company, halfway through the maiden voyage of one of the world's largest liners. While we slowly cruised, we held a service in the first-class dining room in memory of those who were lost and giving thanks for those who had been saved. Except for the boats beside the ship and the icebergs, the sea was strangely empty, hardly a bit of wreckage floated, just a deck chair or two, a few life belts, a good deal of cork, no more flotsam than one could often see on a seashore drifted in by the tide. The ship had plunged at the last, taking everything with her. I saw only one body in the water. The intense cold made it hopeless for anyone to live long in it. It wasn't for us to remain, especially as about this time, eight o'clock, we saw another ship coming. This was the Californian, and all the night had been lying not many miles away, hove to because of the ice. We signalled her now, asking her to continue searching as we were about to make for New York. The sea was rising, and I was anxious to get well away from that danger zone in good daylight. So we got as many of the Titanic's boats as we could on board, some remaining suspended on our da davits, others hauled on the forecastle head, 
and proceeded. Some boats containing the survivors were alongside, people were climbing up the ship's side, others being pulled up, all wearing life belts. And incidentally, it was the wearing of these that protected those who had been so long exposed in the boats and prevented many from dangerous chills. And then, from every quarter, boats were pulling in, making for one common objective, the Carpathia. One thing stands out in my mind about it all, the quietness. There was no noise, no hurry. All our men passengers gave up their cabins, and many of the ladies doubled up with others so as to leave their own quarters free for the distressed. Every officer, of course, yielded his accommodation. In my cabin were three ladies, each of whom were bereaved. Their husbands, all millionaires, had perished, and in addition one lady had lost a son. On the other hand, one had her son with her, whose saving had that touch of the dramatic that was in evidence time and again that night. This boy had been separated from his mother, but later on had found a place in a collapsible boat. His position was even more precarious than it sounds, for since they were helpless to propel it in any way, the boat was floating in the near vicinity of the liner and couldn't move away. It was right under her stern, and from this boy I heard a graphic account of how the Titanic upended herself and remained posed like some colossal nightmare of a fish, her tail high in the air, her nose deep in the water, until she dived finally from human sight. That collapsible was fortunate not to have been sucked down with, that, with the ship. Probably the suction was lessened by reason of the pause and then the sliding movement she took. At all events, the helpless boat merely bobbed a little dangerously and remained afloat. In a little while, a ship's boat came near. It was hailed, and the boy was taken into her, and the first person whom he saw in this rescuing boat was his own mother. Some of the first boats may have got away not filled to capacity, but later others certainly were overloaded, and there were heart-rending moments when two well-laden boats pulling about encountered poor fellows swimming in that ice-cold sea. In this case I am recounting, a boat's gunwale was seized forward by a swimmer. It was well before dawn. No one could see who it was, but many voices were raised protesting against him being hauled in. We are full, we are full, they cried. Don't let him come in. One woman in the stern sheets, however, nursing her sorrow of a husband left behind on the sunken ship, begged for the swimmer to be taken in. The pity in her pleading prevailed, and she knew the swimmer had been saved before she sank back into the frozen coma that great tragedy engenders. Hours passed. At length dawn lit the haggard faces of those who huddled shiveringly in that boat. Only then did the woman see the features of the drenched man she had been chiefly instrumental in dragging from a death by drowning. It was her own husband. It stirred the heart to see the fortitude of the bereaved, must as it sent a glow of pride to listen to some of the tales that were gradually revealed by the survivors of the sights that had been witnessed during those last hours on the sinking ship. Tales of bravery and self-sacrifice that add luster to the human story and shown by every class. In those hours of trial, facing death, men were equal in heroism, whether they were the humblest or such as had much of this world's possessions. And one wondered, looking into the troubled and sometimes vacant faces of those who were saved, whether they, or those left behind, had the harder part to play. But it is sure that there were many that night who, loaded with riches and honours, showed they possessed the greater gifts of self-sacrifice and self-command. A boat full of women was ready for lowering from the stricken ship. It was found to be too full, and the order was given for someone to get out. What a moment!
It had to be done, for the overfull boat endangered the lives of all. A young lady, a girl really, got up to leave the boat. At once some of the others protested, pleading that she should stay. No, she said, you're married and have families. I'm not. It doesn't matter about me. She stepped out of the boat and returned to the deck. She went down with the ship. She gave her life that others might live. No words of mine can add to the beauty of that action. But that night it was duplicated a hundred times as the boats went off, until there were no more to go, and those who remained knew all hope of safety was dissipated. In all that large assembly of differing human beings, I heard of only one instance of selfishness. A certain foreigner who had come aboard bedded himself down in one of the smoke rooms. With an acquisitive eye and disregard of others, he had obtained several blankets for his own comfort. These were draped round his portly figure, when other men found they were devoid of any. He was asked to share up, but adopted the old motto of, What I have, I hold. There was a small council of war among a few men, but the war was soon over, and the blankets distributed. I ought to mention that the Olympic, which at the time of the disaster was some hundreds of miles to the westward, having left New York on the Saturday, had warned us, suggesting she should take off the rescued. But I was against any such move. Fortunately, Mr. Esmay, the chairman of the White Star Line, was among those saved, and when I informed him, suggesting that it would be unwise to endeavour to transship these poor people who had just been saved from the boats, he at once agreed and told me to request the Olympic to keep out of sight. So on we went, still passing other isolated bergs from time to time. I remember that about noon we passed the Russian steamer Burma, who, bound east, made an endeavour to cut through that ice pack, but he turned out again, and I didn't blame him either. We were able to communicate to the Olympic the bare facts of the disaster, and I also sent the official message to the Cunard Company, together with as many names of the survivors as we then had. This offered the first chance we had of dispatching the news to shore. It was, owing to the short range of wireless then in operation, also the last opportunity we had of establishing communication until Wednesday afternoon. And then we learned how the world had waited in suspense for details, and especially a correct and complete list of passengers and crew who had been saved.